Okay. How many people don't know what this is? It's probably not something you're going to run into a lot in Chicago, but it's a water saw. It's a water saw. It's a water saw. Yeah. Um, now, the way this works is this tank is for salt, for bag of salt in here, and this tank is what does the filtration. Now, it's common to see things look like this that may have uh, things like carbon, sediment media, arsenic removal media, any number of different medias can be in a tank like this, and they don't, and they don't require a tank like, like this. But in this particular case, this is a water softener, and you're probably going to see this more in the suburbs than you're going to see it around the city. And very simply, a water softener is composed of about three different components. Maybe four would be a better solution. You've got your salt tank, like right here. You've got what's called your resin tank. And inside this tank, now this tank's empty, there's nothing in here right now. Inside this tank is a polystyrene media that is about the size of a ball on a ballpoint pen. There's billions of little balls in it, okay? And inside this tank, there is a tube that goes down to the bottom, like here, that attaches to this, which is the valve, the control valve, or what is called the control, okay? This controls all the cycles of operation of this piece of equipment. Now, just to go back to understand what happens, water that's hard has calcium and magnesium. That's what makes water hard. When water containing calcium and magnesium is heated, the calcium and magnesium precipitate. They literally fall out of solution and it causes them to stick. So in the bottom of a water heater, you may have many pounds of calcium carbonate. Um, you, you ever see a pipe that's got a lot of sediment inside and, and they, a lot of people call it lime. That's really not what it is, but they call it lime. It's, it's, it's a good thing to call it. Lime scale. Scale. You, you can see it inside the pipes. And as we said, Hardness is a measure of weight. So 20 grains of hardness per gallon to find out how many pounds, you just divide it by 7,000 and that's well, 360 gallons or something like that. 360 gallons to make a pound of dissolved rock. And so if you wanted to, anybody know how many gallons a day the average person uses? Somewhere between 75 and 100 gallons a day for flushing toilets, brushing your teeth, washing dishes, washing clothes, um, showering, doing all this. If you're on the conservative side, it might be 75. If you're not, it might be over 100. A few years ago, the American Water Works Association said it was up to 106. But we typically don't see that. But just to give you an idea of, of what water, what can be in water, it's not unusual for us to see uh, water that has 40 grains per gallon of hardness. Okay? If there's a family of four, that means they use 400 gallons a day times 40, that's 16,000 grains of hardness a day. Divide that by 7,000. Let's we'll take 7,000 grains, make a pound, and that's about 2,200. Um, that's yeah, it's about 2.2. I'm sorry, 2.2 pounds of dissolved rock, calcium and magnesium, and you're running through your plumbing system a day. Let's just round it off to two. In a year, times 365, you've got about 750. 
gallons or 750 pounds of dissolved rock that went through your plumbing system if you have 40 grain hard water. Imagine what that could do to a system. It wreaks havoc. You don't typically see it in, in Chicago and some of the immediate suburb, but you'll see it out farther. You'll see some really hard water. So what a water softener does, it takes that calcium and magnesium out of the water, and typically you're going to regenerate it with sodium or salt. And what, this, what the salt does is, we've got a little resin bead right here. It's about the size of a ballpoint pen, but for the sake of comparison right now, we're going to say it's this big. Resin, when it comes from the manufacturer, it has a positive charge. It has a sodium charge. It's fully charged. When, you dump, we, when we send these out, when you buy one of these, there's a funnel. You pour the resin in. There's a little cap that goes over. There's a, there's a tube down the center. And there's a little cap that goes over the tube so you don't want to dump the resin down the tube. This tube right here, okay? The distributor tube. This is just a one-time use throw it after you're done. Or you can wear it, whatever you want to do. Um, I used to wear one of those at school and it was a little more pointed. Um, so it's got a positive charge of sodium. When the water containing calcium and magnesium comes in contact with a resin bead that has sodium, they want to play musical chairs. They just want to trade places. Why? Why do you jump off a building and you go down? It's the law of gravity. This is the law of ion exchange. Both of these, sodium and calcium and magnesium, have a natural affinity for each other, and in the presence of each other, they want to trade places. So what happens is the calcium and magnesium jumps to the resin bead, and the sodium jumps to the water. And that's just the way it works. It's really simple. They just trade places. The music starts playing, the water starts running, musical chairs, and they trade places. Now, this tank is about half full of resin. It's not filled up all the way because what happens is the water comes in right back here. This is what's called a bypass valve. It's in service when it's like this. I'm going to put it bypass, it's like this. It just bypasses like that. So the water comes in, there's a, there's a little arrow on here, don't hook them up backwards. There's a little arrow that shows the direction of the water coming in. When the water comes in, it comes in the top of this tank. And as it goes down through this resin, it comes to the bottom, and at the bottom of the distributor tube, if you can see, there's real fine slots in there. Small enough to keep the resin out, but large enough to let the water get in. This, this is sitting down here at the bottom. And what happens is, as the water comes through here, it gets out down here, it comes up the tube, and it comes out to the house, and the water's soft. Okay? Now, there's only a finite amount of resin in here. So it's important to size the system so that that resin can soften for two, three, four days before it needs to be regenerated with salt. So what happens is, as the water comes through here, obviously the top resin gets exhausted first. It gives, it gives up its sodium charge and the calcium and magnesium sticks to the resin. It can't soften any more water at that point. And as, as days pass, or hours pass, whatever, you get down here and maybe there's only 30% left. It's time to regenerate. It's time to regenerate. It's time to recharge. Humans recharge by sleeping. This doesn't help. Sleeping doesn't help. This. What this needs is it needs to do this in reverse. So what we're going to do, we've got a, we've got a little tube here, a little 3 8 inch tube, that attaches right here on the, on the sides of this valve and it goes to this tank. 
and down inside this tank there's a float, a safety float, in case the water gets too high in this tank. There's water that stands at the bottom of this tank, maybe about this high. And every gallon of water in this tank dissolves three pounds of salt. So if we need this thing to regenerate with six pounds of salt, we know it's going to take two gallons of water to do that. Okay? And when it recharges, this valve automatically changes its piston. There's a piston in this valve, changes its position. And the very first thing that it does when it's time to regenerate is instead of the water coming in this way, it forces water down this distributor tube and it comes out the bottom. The reason this tank is only half full is we have to have room for expansion. We have to have room for that resin to lift up. You need debris that's accumulated in here, iron, turtles, fish, whatever. It's going to lift it up and float it out. It's going to help get rid of any film, any bacteria, any algae, and yes, it does help get rid of some bacteria too, although this is not, not what it it's not what it's for. So that's the very first cycle of regeneration. It's called backwash. And backwash is very important. The very next cycle is called brine. And again, the piston changes its position and it, put, it forms a suction. There's a nozzle in Venturi right here and it forms a suction from this nozzle in Venturi and sucks the brine water from the brine tank into this tank, sifts down through the resin, and again they play musical chairs. The sodium jumps to the resin bead and the calcium and magnesium jumps to the water stream and it goes down here and then goes out to a drain. There's the drain. It's a half inch drain. This has to be connected to a drain and it needs to be connected using an air gap. Does everybody know what an air gap is? I think Chicago code and most every plumbing code in the country requires that. So at that point, the resin has been refreshed. All the contaminated resin is now recharged and ready to go. This is a process that can be endless. It can go on and on and on. If you, if you set the system up right, if you calibrate it properly, set the salt right, it becomes very easy to do. And, and we'll do it for years upon years upon years. Um, technology has came a long way in the last few years. And this system now, program with a smartphone. And you might say, well, I don't need anything that, that fancy. It's really not fancy. It just makes sense. Um, to set the time of day, this is, it says 431. If I want to set the time, I hit the set button. And it says OK. It'll become the time on my smartphone. Boom. It's the time set. Now, the nice thing is, this will tell you how many gallons a minute you're using, how many gallons a day you're using, and it gives you the historical data over how many gallons you've used the last 30 days or since historically it was installed. I can look at this, and if I've got all the water in the house off, and yet it says I've, I'm using a gallon a minute, what does that mean? I might have a toilet running, right? So there could be leaks. So this, is a, this isn't something fancy. This is a very valuable tool. Um, again, we talked about regeneration. Here's what it does when it regenerates. Hit, hit the regenerate now button. First thing it's going to do, it's going to backwash. You hear it? Now if there was water hooked up to it, you'd hear water running. It stops there. We can program how long it needs to be in backwash. If this is just a filter, not a softener, it's just a backwashing filter, we may backwash it for 10 minutes, rinse it for five minutes and be done. Typically a water softener takes about 90 minutes because in the brine cycle, we're gonna brine it very, very slowly, like a quarter of a gallon a minute. So it takes a little while for all that brine to work through and then we wanna make sure we get it all rinsed out because you don't want the water to taste salty. 
we go to the next step, which is brine and slow rinse. And then the final step is fast rinse. We're rinsing the, rinsing the bed to get everything out of there so it's nice and clean and ready to go. And at that point, the very last, last step is brine refill. How many minutes we set this for, it's, it's going to refill at a quarter of a gallon a minute. If we set it for four minutes, that's two gallons, or it's one gallon rather. If we set it for eight, eight minutes, it's two gallons. <coughs> we also have this technology that is built in with a leak detection. And it has remote leak detectors that communicate back to this control valve so that if you've ever got water running or you have, you have, wet, you have a wet spot on the floor or whatever, it's going to notify you on your smartphone. You can hit a button and you can shut off the water for the whole house. Or you can program it so that it shuts the water off of the whole house for leak detection. So that's basically how a water softener works. It's nothing fancy. Um, the way this one works is there's a Hall effect switch right here, and there's a turbine in here. It counts the gallons. And we know how much resin's in here, we know how much water can soften. That's why it's important to have a good water test because we need to know what the hardness is. We're going to set the hardness, and we know there's 20 grains of hardness in every gallon. We know how many gallons, the computer will calculate how many gallons can go through it, and it'll automatically regenerate when that preset amount hits. Typically, we regenerate at like 2 o'clock in the morning when people are sleeping and not using water. Okay? Um, there's only one moving part in here, so there's really nothing to fear. There's not, not much to go wrong. It's very simple. We've taken a lot of the fear out of it by using the smartphone. Um, a lot of times, does anybody here have a water softener, by the way? So a few people do. Um, do you remember how to set it? I do. Okay. The lines are like manual. Okay. A lot of people can't remember how to set it. Power goes out, they don't remember how to set it. The daylight savings time comes and they don't know how to set it. With this, go to your smartphone, set, boom, it becomes the time of your smartphone. So unless your time's off here, your time's not going to be off here. Um, we use a tank just like this to take out iron, sulfur, and manganese as well. And typically, what we'll do with something like that is By the way, the reason we're videoing this is so I'd like to have handouts, but we just don't get it. We do this periodically and we don't have handouts, so he's videoing this so that we can have it transcribed so that we can put some handouts the next time we do this. So if you come back in the future, it will get better. You won't just have to listen to me doing some pictures too, which, you know, that's probably a good thing. So we talked about hydrogen peroxide and taking out sulfur and iron and manganese. Essentially we've got a tank that looks just like this. We've got a water meter and we've got a, a solution tank that has a chemical feed pump on it. Now to inject hydrogen peroxide into the water you can't use a diaphragm pump because the H2O2 will airlock the diaphragm pump. We have to use a peristaltic pump. Does everybody know what a peristaltic pump is? A peristaltic pump uses a tube uh, about this long that goes through three eccentrics. They're off center and they a motor turns them and they press on that tube and it positively displaces the peroxide. They use it in the medical infusion field, typically. They use, they use uh, peristaltic pumps in the medical infusion field. So uh, you have to use a peristaltic pump. You inject that into here based upon the flow of the meter. As soon as the hydrogen sulfide hit the media and the peroxide, it's instantly oxidized. And when you oxidize something, you start out with something this big and you reduce
reduce it to that big. Oxidation, the opposite of oxidation is reduction. Opposite of reduction is oxidation. So you start out with something very big and reduce it to something this big. And this is going back to home now, so it's, it's all done. And it's trapped in here. So periodically, about every other day, for maybe 10 or 15 minutes, this needs to backwash to get all that suspended solids, the, the oxidized material out. And it just goes down the drain. At that point, when the water comes out of here, it's iron and sulfur free. If you have hard water, you may want a water softener after this. Or there could be any number of other things. It could be arsenic in the water. We talked earlier about arsenic, and arsenic is something we're seeing more and more. Uh, some of it is from industrial processes, but arsenic is one of the most common uh, elements that can be found in, in the Earth's surface. There's a lot of arsenic in the water. And it used to be the level for arsenic, the minimum contaminant level, was 50. Now they reduced it to less than 10, and some states have went to less than five. So again, here's where water testing becomes vitally important. We need to know competing contaminants. For instance, if you've got arsenic in the water, do you have iron? Do you have sulfur? What's the pH? Because those competing contaminants can prevent the arsenic from being taken out of the water with this method. If you have much iron in the water, you can bind the iron to the arsenic and filter it out 100%. But again, that's why you need a water test to do this. Okay? Now, this, this product, you know, as time goes on, you guys are going to have an opportunity to install some of these. And maybe you've seen water softeners and sears, or they're still in business, Home Depot or whatever. Um, typically, they're just in one tank. What happens is they put this tank inside this tank to save space, and it's a smaller tank. And guess what? It doesn't do as much because it's smaller, it's not going to take out as much, and it becomes a problem. Okay? The other problem is the electronic controls are in the same tank where the salt is. You think that's a good thing? It's like buying a new car, taking it down and parking it on Miami Beach and letting the salt splash up on it all the time. Probably going to be a problem. So, water softeners that are cabinet models, and when we say a cabinet model, this tank sits inside this tank. It's not really the way to go. This is called a two-tank model. That's the way to go. That's made for longevity. And, for instance, on our systems, this, this whole thing right here, the control, it has a 10-year warning. And that's how easy it comes off. How much is that? The control. Pardon? The control. How much is that? The control um, retails $4.99. That's what retail is. Um, so you can buy that. I mean, people do buy this and put it on other water softeners. Uh, with most of them it is. Yeah, these threads on most water softeners are two and a half inch. Now, see this distributor tube? Does everybody see that? Yeah. That's where the water goes through. That's, that's one inch inside. Um, and that's where this connects up. See, it's got a O-ring right here. Put a little silicone on that O-ring. This is an upper distributor to keep the to keep the uh, media from coming out, okay? So it goes on like this, slides down. I don't have any silicone with me, so I'm not gonna put it on. But um, does everybody know why you use silicone instead of Vaseline? Yeah, it, it'll eat up the rubber. I have seen, I've seen people put Vaseline on the seals on these big blue, they call these big blue, this is gray. I've seen people put Vaseline on there, and a year later try to take it off. Put a 36 inch pipe wrench on it, couldn't get it off. Because the rubber expanded, you're just not gonna get it off. So we always suggest silicone. We, we have tubes of silicone. Um, 
buy a five ounce tube in the last 10 years probably. Don't use very much, but uh, it's, it's a good thing for plumbers to carry, and, and I know most plumbing supply houses have it too. Um, this is very easy to test, to diagnose, to set up. It's very intuitive. I suggest reading manuals. I mean, you can program this with what, what I call the dinosaur buttons, but why? You've got a smartphone, just program with that, and 30 seconds, you're done. And again, this is the funnel that we use. Uh, you notice a little bit of a dull sheen on here. Um, obviously, this is just protective. Inside the brine tank, I mean, you want to make sure that the fittings are tight, secured. We use a push-in fitting on here, the Quick Connect John Guest type fittings in here. Um, just want to make sure that it's connected up well, connected up to there, and the drain with an air gap, and you're done. Very simple, not difficult at all. Any questions so far? Do you recommend replacing the resin ever until it's considered? Um, well, I mean, it depends. Uh, this particular model has a lifetime warranty on the resin. Uh, we use a special 10% cross-link resin, which lasts a lot longer. Is it going to last a lifetime? Maybe, maybe not, but it's going to last a long time. Um, if you're on city water that's highly chlorinated and you use a regular water softener, the chlorine will degrade the resin very, very quickly. I've seen it go bad in three years. So if you've got, they, they cross linkage is what they, how they rate, how they rate resin and how many, what the percentage of cross linkage is. Some is 6%, 7%, the best resin is 8%, the very best resin is 10%, that's what we use. We use 10% cross link resin across the board. Last a long time, It'll, but on heavily, heavily chlorinated city water, it might only last 10, 12 years. I mean, I'm talking about heavily. Earlier about conceding. You want to get the chlorine out before you want to do the soft. Put a car in the yeah. So we always, we specialize in using, I mean, a very, it's very common um, on, on city water to use a carbon filter and a water softener after it. And then you're going to have some really, really good water that's clarified, clean, pure, clear, and smells good, tastes good. Uh, but again, you may not like the taste of salt in the water. I don't. So for, for water that is uh, softened or for water that's of unknown quality, can you grab the RO back there, Gerard? Um, sink reverse osmosis system okay and uh, you know it's it's really not is it is anybody in here ever installed one of these quarter inch it's a quarter inch feed quarter inch to the drain three eighths to the tank and three eighths to the faucet this is a ballast tank. It's rated at three, at four and a half gallons. It probably holds in the real world a little over two um, because it's got a bladder in it. So at any given time, you're going to have about two, two and a half gallons of water on tap. Um, comes with its own faucet, like so. And typically, you have to drill a hole or use where the where the uh, sprayer is. And this is for drinking, cooking. What does that setup cost? This whole setup is um, two fifty nine or no one ninety nine. Yeah, one ninety nine. Yeah, they're pretty inexpensive. Yeah, a lot of people stop drinking tap water now. Yeah, I mean this is as good as bottled water. Has anybody ever drank Aquafina? I mean, Aquafina is reverse osmosis water. 
Now, I can't tell you what kind of water you're going to like. I mean, do you like Pepsi? Do you like Coke? Do you like Mountain Dew? I mean, you know, everybody's taste is different. But with reverse osmosis water, we're, we're taking out all the cations and all the anions. We're taking out the chemicals, pesticides, chlorine, chloramine, all those things. You just got regular water. Now, some people say, well, the minerals in the water are good for me, right? Yeah. The minerals are good for you. Here's the only thing, though. Water is not a significant source of minerals. Think about that for a second. Water is not a significant source of minerals. You get your minerals from your supplements or from food you eat, things like that. You know, you, you could drink a bathtub of water a day and get about 5% of the minerals you need. So, you know, some people say, well, I don't want reverse osmosis water because it takes out the minerals. It also takes out the 38,000 other chemicals that could be in the water. <laughs> You know, so, I mean, I, and then, and then there's the debate. <coughs> Reverse osmosis also takes out fluoride. And then there's the debate, well, the fluoride's good for you. Well, I'm not going to take, take either side on that, but I will tell you that fluoride is a deadly poison. If you drink much of it, you're going to die. They say it's good for your teeth, so why not use topical applications or a toothpaste that has fluoride in it and not worry about drinking it and then put it on your teeth and then spit it out or you can do fluoride treatments in your dentist. Uh, one lady told me, well I'm not going to take out the fluoride. I said, so your kids can die with a full set of teeth? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> That's a little bit extreme but there's a lot of truth in that because you know there's some, floor, some cities the fluoride levels are getting so high that it's being difficult to deal with. <coughs> yes, reverse osmosis takes out fluoride. If you're concerned about that, then talk to your dentist. I talk to my dentist. As a matter of fact, my dentist has an RO system too. So, um, I guess that says what he thinks about it. Um, this comes with tubing, and it's pretty simple. It's color coded tubing. Um, And these are the, by the way, we were talking about two and a half by 10 inch cartridges, housings. These are the two and a half by 10s, okay? In no way is that for a whole house, in my opinion. Um, we've got a couple of unique things here that most companies aren't gonna do this. We, we've did this ourselves for so long that we pretty much uh, are resigned to doing it the right way or not doing it. Here is our inlet valve. Maybe you've seen self-piercing saddle valves. They probably should be illegal if they're not because they're gonna leak. What this does is where your, your uh, tube goes in, you just take it loose, put the nut over here, the ferrule and the nut, screw this back on. There you go. You got, you got a, a valve that's gonna last for a long, long time. Pass that around so everybody can look at it. <coughs> then we've got a drain saddle that goes around your your tailpiece under your sink, and it's good. Let's just let's just look at a double bowl sink here. Maybe you've got a disposal on one side. It's always best to put this on the other side, away from, away from the uh, disposal. And if you're putting this under the sink, you need an air gap faucet. There's, there's a faucet that has a built-in air gap so that the water can't back up from here into the RO system. So you need an air gap faucet. This one does not have an air gap faucet with it. Uh, a lot of people don't like to use air gap faucets because they're a pain in the neck, but it's a plumbing code. And if you're going to do it right, you've got to do it with an air gap faucet. On the tank, does everybody know what John Guest is? We use John Guest fittings, John Guest valves, and on the tank valve, um, 
We use a John Guest valve. It's a quick connect fitting. If, for those of you that don't know, um, I'm not going to throw it on there. You know how the quick connect fittings, does everybody know how the quick connect fittings work? I'm not assuming anything. Uh, the shock pipe. John, John, John Guest is a plastic version of shock pipe. Actually been around longer than shock pipe. So, so <coughs> then you just push it in until it latches. Won't come out unless you pull the collet in and it comes out. Yep. Now, if you do that six or eight times, you may scar this pipe a little bit, and then it's a good idea to snip a little bit off and put it back on. Um, one of the things that we include with this is a means of sanitizing the system. So when you install this, the line to the tank We've got this liquid sanitizer solution. We put this syringe, and you inject it right into the tube, hook it back up, and then when the water kicks on, it's, it's going to sanitize the system through the final filter. Again, we talked about inlet, tank, faucet, drain. I mean, anybody can install one of these. Um, there's a shutoff valve, a diaphragm valve right here, that when the tank reaches two-thirds of line pressure, it's going to shut off. It's not going to waste any more water, okay? So it's going to shut off and it's done with that. The filters, this is the reverse osmosis membrane, which goes right here. This is the final polishing filter, and then there are three other filters. There's a sediment depth filter, and there's two carbon block filters. So we're going to take out all those chemicals before it gets to the membrane. The membrane is going to take out all the total dissolved solids, fluoride, arsenic, nitrates, chemicals, all that stuff. Then it goes to the tank, and then before it comes through the faucet, it goes through the final polishing carbon filter just to take out any strange taste or anything that might be there from tubing or tank or whatever. We suggest replacing these filters once a year, um, and in most cases, that's, that's plenty. A filter pack like that costs like $34. So if you stop and think about it, for $199, you can buy an RO system, you can change the filters once a year for $35, and you don't have to buy any bottled water. We did a, last weekend, we did a craft beer conference where we donated, uh, this was called the Winterfest in Indianapolis. And they had like 8,000 people there drinking craft. They paid $75 a piece to drink this craft beer. And la the last few years, they've had water companies come in with bottled water. Because when people are tasting beer, they also like to drink water. I didn't know how much they like to drink water. We went through like 800 gallons, 800 gallons and 8,000 people in four hours. Um, and what we did was we put a commercial reverse osmosis system on site and we filled 80 gallon storage tanks. We had five stations around, but we filled 80 gallon storage tanks with RO water, carted them over to water coolers and hooked them up. And uh, I, I was just shocked how much water they went through. But one of the things that we think is, is being responsible is not filling landfills with bottles, you know? Buy a couple of glass bottles you can carry with you and fill your own bottles. Take a thermos to work instead of buying all this bottled water. I need a drink. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Now, do you install this under the sink? You can install it under the sink. In my house, I've got it installed in the basement. Okay. I've got it mounted on the wall in the basement. We have another version. It's got a permeate pump. It's a non-electric pump that takes some of the drain water, helps repressurize it back to the inlet side, gives you more pressure and it wastes less water, and um, it adds about 50, 60 bucks. And I got mine sitting in the basement. I got it run into a humidifier, two ice makers, and a kitchen sink. Now, if you install this into the seat, is there a certain amount of clearance you're going to need for the, the drop each one of those filters to uh, change them? Well, you can you can mount it. If, you only need about two inches. You can mount it, but a lot of people just let it sit there. 
they let it sit under the sink or maybe they mount it just barely up. You, you can do whatever you want. It's a good idea to secure it so you don't knock it over or anything. But as long as it's as long as it's sitting off the bottom by an inch or two, you're fine. Because the, the filters I mean there's there's the clearance that you need right there. So that's that's really all the clearance you need. I, I talked to a 63-year-old grandmother from Tucson a while back. She said she installed it herself under the sink. And she said it took her six hours. She said if it was really hot, I had to drink a lot of beer. So if a 63-year-old grandmother could do it, I know any plumber could do it. So pretty simple to do. Um, the nice thing about it is reverse osmosis takes out the widest spectrum of contaminants of any water treatment process. Think about that for a minute. The widest spectrum of contaminants of any water treatment process. Does it take out everything? I mean, no. And here's the other thing. Reverse osmosis, I mean, some people say, well, I've got really bad sulfur water. Can I put reverse osmosis? Yeah, it'll probably plug up in a week. You've got to use pretty clean water it's already got to be pretty clean. In other words, if there's iron or sulfur or manganese, you've got to take that out. If there's high hardness, you've got to take that out. If there's sediment, you need to take that out. You know, there's no perfect process, okay? Um, if you've got bacteria, that's a whole other issue too. What do you do for bacteria? No, traditionally people have used chlorine and Providing you have enough contact time, that can work. But more and more people these days are going to ultraviolet light or UV light. And basically, all you've got is you've got a stainless steel chamber, might be two and a half inches in diameter, with an inlet and an outlet. And inside that chamber, you've got a quartz sleeve. <coughs> I know there's one down here in your rainwater reclamation area because I saw it. And inside that quartz sleeve, you got a UV ball. And that ball is at 256 nanometers. That's the wavelength. 256 <coughs> nanometers. That's known as the germicidal range. What happens is you have, and, and water may come out here, may come in here. That quartz sleeve prevents water from touching the bulb, and yet the quartz allows transmission of the ultraviolet light. When UV light hits any microorganism, it, it messes up its DNA. It, it, it totally wipes out the, the, the stages of their DNA, and the bacteria dies. They can't live. Now, a caveat, again, Water's got to be pretty clean, or the little critters can have things in the water they can hide behind. You've got sediment or iron or sulfur in that water, or have tannin that the water's discolored, or high turbidity that you can't see through the water. Them little critters can hide behind there, and you're not going to kill them. So typically, if you're doing ultraviolet, it's going to be the very last step of any water filtration process going to be the very last. You want to clean that water up as much as possible. In fact, this could be a typical well water system that you might see. You might start out with a 5 micron pre-filter like this. Okay? And then maybe we're going through a hydrogen peroxide system where we're going to inject hydrogen peroxide here. And then we're going through a water softener, the salt tank right here. And then maybe we're going to come out of that and go through another filter again. This would be a one micron, just like this, to really tighten that filtration down to make sure there's nothing in that water. And then at that point, you might have the ultraviolet light. And very possibly an RO for drink. We sell those kind of systems all the time. Somebody was telling me they'd, they'd like to make this overkill. Well, you might think this is overkill, but I don't think it's overkill. Um, more and more people are putting ultraviolet lights on city water. 
And you say, well, isn't the city supposed to make the water safe for us? You're supposed to. Think the government might ever let us down on anything? <laughs> the water's safe. My city never had a boil order. Flint, Michigan doesn't exist. You know, I mean, lots of problems in the water and we need to realize our infrastructure is aging, our water delivery system's aging, and if we're going to treat all the water as if it's going to be internally consumed, which 99% of the water that comes from a water treatment plant is not for internal usage. It's for flushing toilets, fighting fires, industrial usage. Are we naive enough to believe that we can treat all that water, the city can afford to treat that water? Because if you think they are, I guarantee you, in about five years, your water bill is going to go to about 500%. They can't do it. That's why it's so important to learn how to install these systems because the point of use and the point of entry water treatment business is going to start booming. It is booming. People have to take responsibility for their water. The government's not going to take responsibility for your water. And if you're on well water, it's your responsibility anyway. You should be testing that water once a year. If I was on well water, I would definitely have an ultraviolet light, and on city water, I have one too. Because I don't trust the government to give me the kind of water that I want every day. Maybe I'm a fanatic about it. But, you know, water is life. And the cleaner your water, the better your health. I mean, I'm a person who doesn't drink pop. Um, I've been known occasionally to drink something in a brown bottle, but we won't talk about that. That's a standard size, right? Yeah, this? Yeah, we typically have have about three sizes. We have a 50 gallon a day, we have a 100 gallon a day, and a 150 gallon a day. Now you think, well, 150 gallon a day, I don't need anything like that. I don't even need 50 gallon a day. It's not how many gallons a day you use, it's how fast you fill the tank. Because you're working from this tank. So if you're if you only use a gallon a day, then that's fine. Use five, ten gallons a day. Maybe you want to go with a hundred gallon a day system to fill the tank up quicker so you won't be out of water because when you use all the water up in this tank, you're done. In my house, I've got, I told you I have mine in the basement. I've got a uh, 14 gallon tank. So the 14 gallon tank with the bladder holds about nine or ten gallons. So we don't ever run out, ever run out of water. Now, with all those systems that you said back there to make your water really safe, like, what would that cost to put all that in? Um, you need three to probably retails three to four thousand dollars. Okay. Now, like, what would be like the monthly or yearly cost for like you know electric and you know the filters? Well, this operates on low voltage, so it probably uses about two dollars a year in electricity. Okay. Um, so each of these each of these tanks would use about two dollars. Uh, the peroxide, you might use $200 a year peroxide. Uh, you might use $70 or $80 worth of salt. Okay. And uh, replace these filters once a year, they're like $49 a piece. And then replace the UV bulbs about $100, and then the filter packs $34. So it could be a couple, it could be four or $500 a year. Okay. You know, but if you've got bad water, yeah. what do you do? All right, one more yep. question. Now, you know you can use sodium or uh, potassium, right? Mm -hmm. Tablets. Now, say I have I'm using sodium, but I want to switch it to potassium just to see what the difference is. Do I have to like completely drain that tank of all the sodium? No. It it's just that sodium is about 11 percent more efficient than potassium, so you have to set the salt up. You have to set the salting up a little bit, or set the capacity back a little bit. Okay. It's about 10 percent, 10, 11 percent. So, honestly, to me. I would never use potassium because it's so expensive. And why not? It would be cheaper to buy an RO system to take out the sodium okay. than to pay the extra for the potassium. So with that many systems back to back like that, do you typically see a reduction in pressure in the outside pump? Nope, it's all we've designed these systems for full flow. No. Now if you're using this Two and a half by ten or two and a half by twenty cartridges, yes. But these are made. You're not going to notice any difference in flow rate. It, 
you'll typically get five to six gallons per minute, uh, or five to six PSI pressure drop through a system. It's very small. I mean, if you got if you got 30 PSI starting, that's probably a problem. But most places have 50, 60, 70 pounds. When I was on well water, I set mine at 60, 80. Pump would kick on at 60 and off at 80. I like plant pressure. More questions on that? Yeah, I'm sorry about my age, but I was just talking about the pressure. Uh, did you uh, maybe point out to them, uh, like maybe that RO system, why it would be serving things specifically, like a point of use thing, like an ice maker, or just a single faucet that's specialized for that, mm -hmm. and maybe not a whole? Okay. Yeah. For a okay. It's a good question. Um, well, it's only going to, it's got a small tank. You're going to be working from this tank, okay? So you don't want it. You don't need it for washing dishes. You don't need it for um, flushing your toilet or anything like that. You don't need it for washing laundry or even showering. It's just for internal consumption. This particular system. Now you can run it to multiple outlets like ice makers. I mean, your ice maker will last forever because it's not going to get encrusted with hard water uh, and it makes better ice. Ice freezes quicker. Uh, <coughs> most of the uh, hockey arenas use RO water for making the ice because it freezes harder and quicker and clearer. So um, you're going to make the ice, generally the process by which they make the ice will determine on how clear it's going to be. Sometimes it, it it's got a little cloudiness in the middle, but your ice will be really, really clear with RO water. And if you're making a drink with nasty ice cubes, it's not good, even if you have good clean water. So you might as well use, use it for any drinking, cooking, things like that. Um, we, we did a, uh, we just did a, we, we do installations like locally in, in, in the Indianapolis area. And we just did a installation for a, uh, I can't say who it was, but he's a former quarterback that just retired. You might be able to figure out who it is. Um, what's, what's, being more, what's becoming more common is whole house RO systems. We're, we're putting in more and more whole house RO systems. And in his case, he opted to just run with PEX uh, 11 lines to every drinking water, to every sink in the house. So he ran it to the, to the ice makers, uh, kitchen sinks, pot fillers, um, all the bathroom faucets, uh, cappuccino machine. Um, and then we, re we, we do probably, how many whole house systems do we do a week, whole house ROs? Probably six or seven? More than that. Okay. We, we probably do a dozen a week. Okay. Um, so whole house RO is becoming real popular because think about it. Is it overkill? Maybe. But it takes out the largest spectrum of contaminants. And so if you've got copper plumbing, you need to remineralize a little bit. You need to add some minerals back or, or adjust the pH. But a lot of houses are plumbed in PEX these days. And so if they're plumbed in PEX, put it in and you're done. Um, as I said, it takes out the largest spectrum of contaminants. About two years ago, we started, we had another company manufacture a line of commercial RO systems for us, and because I thought that this is an emerging market, um, just more and more whole house RO systems. And I had no idea how well it was going to take off. He says a dozen a week. Um, they couldn't keep up with us. And we kept, we get 13, 14 week lead times and people hate that. So about, a, about six months ago, we, we decided to start building our own. And so we started manufacturing our own. Now we've got it down to less than two weeks lead time and we're trying to get them on the shelf so that we can, you know, just pull them off the shelf and ship them. But uh, a whole house RO system is going to be more and more common because it takes out such a large spectrum of contaminants. And with the advent of new reverse osmosis technology, you know that, for instance, this system right here, for every gallon of water that it makes, it wastes three gallons, okay? Now, people say, oh, that's horrible, okay? Well, think about this. If you make two gallons a day, you wasted six. 
I mean, flush the toilet a couple times and you waste six gallons. I am mindful that it is wasteful though, but what's more wasteful? Driving to the store and get bottles that are in plastic and spend gas to go there or to make your own water. Now, with our new reverse osmosis systems, they are 80% efficient. And what I mean by that is, we make four gallons for every gallon we waste. So if you make 400 gallons a day, you're gonna waste 100 gallons. But you're gonna waste water when you backwash a softener or backwash a filter or whatever too. I mean, how many, how efficient is your washing machine or your dishwasher? Your washing machine wastes every gallon that you make. Your dishwasher make waste every gallon that it uses. And that waste water, uh, what's the quality of that waste water? Can it be reused for irrigation? In most cases, it can. In most cases, now, if you're if you've got 2,400 PDS, which we see in places in Colorado and stuff like that, you're not going to recycle that. But around here, um, I mean, I'm when I get done here, I'm going over to visit a customer that's in. Um, tell you. I can find where it's at. It's on uh, Shagbark Road in Metawa, Illinois. And he's got a, he got a 12,000 gallon a day RO system in a house. It's a big house, very big house. But he wanted RO water, and uh, more and more people are wanting. They're wanting the best. Um, the next thing that's coming is alkaline water, and we're coming out with uh, it's called libation hydration technology. We're coming out with a new alkaline water that is designed to hydrate the body quicker. Athletes use it for recovery. We're uh, using an Indy Racing League this year. Um, because, you know, like in an Indy car, you're only allowed a liter and a half of water. And if you can hydrate 5-10% better because the water is alkaline, which has a high pH, it has a lower ORP, which is oxidation reduction potential, your body can utilize it, can metabolize it better, you'll be more alert, you'll be stronger, you'll be quicker, you'll be faster, and hopefully that gives you the edge to win in the athletic endurance event. So those are, those are new things that are coming down the road like two. We've got some other things, um, bacteria killing technology. Um, we've, got a, we've got a new technology called uh, quantum disinfection. And just imagine this, you've got a little ceramic bead that on that bead we've vapor deposed elemental silver and manganese oxide, just like a circuit board. And when a bacteria touches this media, the media is hungry for electrons. It immediately sucks the electrons out of the bacteria, causing the cell wall to collapse and it ceases to exist on a subatomic level. So there's some really cool stuff coming down the pipe. Um, but water treatment should be your friend as a plumber, not, not an enemy. It should be something that you, you can become adept in. Um, we're, we're really taking the lead trying to be, there, there's no formal training for people in the water treatment industry. I mean, you guys, this is amazing. This, I mean, we came in here and, and see this center, it's amazing. I mean, I hope you guys appreciate it because it's a, this is, this is quite a chunk of, this of change to build it, and this is a state of the art. Um, I don't know if, you, if I told you the story or not, but I, I was a plumber, and uh, you know, I, I appreciate this kind of stuff, and uh, it's, pretty amazing what they're doing for you here. We don't have any formal training in our industry. So we're kind of taking the lead. We're, we're coming to you and doing this. He's videoing what we're doing. We're gonna start making, making videos. We're gonna start making manuals. And we're gonna to try to take the lead in, in doing this training because so much of it is just on the job training. There's no formal training. And you guys really should be thankful about this formal training that you got because it's pretty awesome. Hey Mark, can you go over um the anti scallant with the whole house and it's truth okay. salt free. So, when you're doing a whole house RO system, um, used to be we always had to use the water softener, and you definitely want to take out the chlorine if you're on city water. So, 
Typically, you're going to have something like this, full of carbon. But nowadays, we're not using water softeners anymore. We are injecting an anti-scalant ahead of the RO. The reverse osmosis membrane rejects the anti-scalant, but it prevents the membrane from scaling. So instead of having to haul salt, we've got a we've got a 32 ounce bottle of anti-scalant you mix with 15 gallons of water. It might last you six or eight months. And we inject that anti-scalant ahead of the reverse osmosis membrane so that you don't get any scaling or maintains the efficiency of the system for years and years. And so a, a typical whole house RO system will include a um, reverse osmosis system, which is about this big. Uh, it'll include a carbon filter. It'll include typically a 140 gallon storage tank, a UV and a repressurization pump, because this is an atmospheric tank. And that, those are the key components. Carbon filter, an anti-scalant, which is a chemical injection pump, the RO, the storage tank, the UV, and the, and the, and the booster pump. And we have packages where the UV, and the booster pump, and everything are built into this, so really, uh, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty plug and play. It's pretty simple to do. And it's a lot of people you're going to hear about it. They don't want to use softeners because of the salt. Mark addressed it earlier. You're going to hear people asking you for salt-free softeners. Well, they don't exist, but you can prevent some of it, and that's why they might put the anti-scanner thing to protect the membranes. But salt-free softeners don't exist. And Mark can go. There's a lot of there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of people, not as many now as there were a couple years ago, but the Water Quality Association. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. But the Water Quality Association is a trade association for the water treatment industry. They're located in Naperville, uh, the National Association is. And they have now put out formal mandates that members cannot call a product a salt-free water softener if it doesn't soften the water. And there's a lot of people who are selling systems that they say are salt-free softeners and they do not soften the water whatsoever. Um, and so January 1st, those rules went into effect and I, I, we've seen people pulling their advertising now, and I know it's hurting their sales because people love, oh, I can buy a salt-free software? Yeah, I'll buy that. Well, they get it and find out it doesn't soften the water. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's something to think about. If you see somebody that says they have a salt-free software, the odds are that's not true. Well, not the odds are. It's simply not true. <laughs> it's not true. It's false. Uh, how, how do they get away with it? I don't know. It is due. I mean, people, nobody's taking them to task, I guess, except me. Uh, we write, a, on, on our website, I write a blog, and I pretty well rake them over the coals with, um, with regularity. They're not very happy with me, but, you know, I just think it's bad for consumers to be lied to. If, if you sell somebody, say, I've got a water heater, but it doesn't actually heat the water, I don't think most people are going to be happy. If you've got a water softener that doesn't actually soften the water, they're not going to be happy. I had one customer who bought one from a company, and they called him up and said, I just tested his water and it's not soft. They said, well, it doesn't actually soften the water. <laughs> Wait a minute. You called it a water softener. I mean, it's like almond milk, okay? They don't call it milk. They call it almond milk. Now, the milk producers association is taking homage to that. They don't want to, want to call it milk at all. But guess what? They, they preface it with it's almond milk. They don't think it's cow's milk. They've got the Impossible Burger now, and the Meat Producers Association are, are going against that because they don't want them calling it a burger. But, you know, at least we know what it is. So many people in the water conditioning business have, for years, used a lot of smoke and mirrors. Um, I remember a few years ago, I was invited to speak at a uh, car dealership. They had about 200 salesmen, and they invited me in. And you know how they, when, when you're introducing somebody, you know, and how they say how great they are, and all this, all the lies they tell about them. Uh, well, they were introducing me, and you know, saying, you know, some Mark Timmons, blah blah blah. And I get up there, and I said, you know what? That's not really why I'm here. I said. Used car salesmen have a bad rep. You know, they don't have a good reputation. 
So your boss looked high and low and tried to find somebody in another industry that was worse than a used car salesman. And all he could come up with was a water treatment guy. But some of these guys are just, I mean, they're scaring people to death when they get people's houses. You don't have to scare people to death. You just have to tell them the truth. The truth is, our water quality isn't what it once was. We have the technology to fix it. And if you want to do that, I can help you do that. And some of you right now think, well, I'm not really going to be involved in water treatment. I guarantee you, many of you are. As time moves forward, you're going to be involved in more than you, than you can anticipate. So I'd urge you to embrace it, take, take that opportunity to move forward, and uh, that's why we're here. Um, what I'd like to do is if we take another 10 minute break yeah. and then come back, if you have any questions specifically, we'll address them. And then I've got a couple final things to talk about.